Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I am Miranda Witherspoon Richardson, and I am the founder and president of Black Funders of St. Louis. I'm hoping everyone can hear me okay. And if you can't, there's a chat on the side, so feel free to put in the chat if you're having any issues with seeing any of the presenters or hearing any of the presenters. Today's webinar, Rising to the Occasion, a primer on surviving COVID-19 for Black-led nonprofit organizations. Before we officially begin, I would definitely like to acknowledge where we are right now in our times and ask that everyone consider how you can prioritize self-care as well as elevate the importance of finding your place and showing up for your community. There's a lot going on right now and we wanna make sure that we're showing up in a way that is a benefit um, to our communities. Just a little bit about Black Funders of St. Louis. We are a giving circle. We were founded in 2016 with the support of um, six other individuals to bring this to fruition. Um, the idea behind Black Funders of St. Louis is how do we collectively pull our time, our talent, and our treasures to invest into Black spaces, into Black-led nonprofit organizations? And with that, uh, we define Black-led as the president, the CEO, our executive director identifies as Black. Um, I know there's a lot of definitions for Black-led, but in terms of Black Funders of St. Louis, ours is pretty narrow. And so we want to be intentional about how we give back our time, our talent, and our resources to support and elevate um, Black-led nonprofit organizations. Um, with that, um, our membership is open to individuals and or couples who self-identify as Black, reside in the St. Louis metropolitan area, and make an annual commitment of $300. Black Funders of St. Louis exist, um, as I mentioned early, earlier, is because we need this space. Um, it's important that Black people are making decisions for Black people. It's important that Black-led nonprofits um, are well-resourced and also uh, remain viable assets within our community. We need your help. We cannot do this alone. We need your help. And so if you have any questions or need additional information about Black Funders of St. I'm sorry, Black Funders of St. Louis, please feel free to email um, or reach out. We are available. We're on social media. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on there as Black Funders STL. Our website, uh, most of you have probably viewed it by now through registration, um, www.blackfundersstl.com. Um, again, we're available, we need you. We're asking you all to figure out, you know, how you can show up in this space, whether it's giving your time or talent, becoming a member. Um, Black-led nonprofits need us more now than ever. And so we wanna make sure that these organizations remain viable assets within our community. And so with that, I'm going to pause. I'm gonna be on the webinar the whole time. Should any questions come up about Black Funders of St. Louis, I am available. Um, this um, example, um, of what we're doing today is how we give back our time and our talent. And so today we have a panel full of awesome presenters who are giving back their time and talent to Black-led nonprofit organizations. So I challenge everyone on today's call um, to think about how you can show up. Um, we recognize that money um, can sometimes be an obstacle, but don't let it be your obstacle. No donation is too small. So if you're not able to join at the $300 membership, we welcome donations um, in the amount of uh, as small as a dollar because that dollar can help us help Black-led nonprofit organizations. Also, something important to note is that at minimum, 85 cents on every dollar goes back into Black-led nonprofits in our region. And so we want to make sure that we are able to be a viable resource to Black-led nonprofit organizations. And so with that, I challenge you all to figure out how you can find your space um, and Black Funders of St. Louis and are in your community. Um, with that, just a reminder, there is a chat. And so everyone is muted. And so if you have questions, you want to engage, you can use the chat um, that is in the Zoom app to communicate with presenters and our attendees as well. So I will pause right now and I will turn it over to our presenters. Thank you all again for making time to be a part of today's webinar. Well, I think I uh, am the first presenter. I didn't know if there was going to be an introduction of all of us, 
My name is Marne Morgan, and I'm the CEO, Principal Consultant of Morgan Graves Consultants. And I am really um, happy and pleased and excited to be a part of this discussion today because it brings attention to not only what we're experiencing now, but highlighting the, the need to support our Black-led organizations. I'm speaking from the strategic planning and, and program refinement lens and wanting to uh, message to everyone that this is not a downtime. Our theme is rising to the occasion, which typically suggests that in a, a circumstance or situation, we have to uh, react or respond to what is going on. Unfortunately, with small Black-led organizations, we find ourselves rising to the occasion, occasion all the time because we lack the, the resources, we lack access, and we lack those things that ne we need to get to the next level. And yet, on a shoestring budget and with very little in, in, in resources, we get it done. So I wanna talk a little bit about the three areas that I feel can support us as we try to respond to the current climate. First and foremost is leadership engagement. Next, looking at the shift, pivot and transition. And then finally, adaptive action. When you're talking about uh, leadership engagement, Certainly, we as leaders of organizations, we are fully accountable. We are responsible for all that goes on in terms of decisions, how we respond, and where we move from day to day. I want us to look at leadership a little bit differently today, supporting the team as part of the team, removing the, the leadership hat and immersing yourself as the team looking at empathetic leadership and what the team is thinking and what their concerns are and why this is such a challenging time. Have an understanding around this is not the norm. COVID-19 is something that we're all caught off guard by, totally unexpected, and it's impacting us in ways that we still don't process well. However, if you keep your dialogue and conversations ongoing, you can find out quickly what's working and what is not. I also encourage leadership mindfulness, being present, allowing the team to lead, understanding change, and more importantly, understanding that pushback. You'll have folks who don't know what to do. They don't know how to do. So they're going to depend and rely on you to fill in those gaps and to help support what those challenging times are. Accountability begins with the leader. So if we transition accountability from one person to the team, that means that we are going to support any decision that is made in terms of downsizing programs, revisiting our strategic plan, looking at where we want to continue our support. We have to stand by our decisions to stabilize and defend our core business. But in the absence of resources and money to do that during this time, we have to call upon our stakeholders and look at volunteers, look at the commitment of our board and how we can bring all hands on deck to support moving the organization and continuing the move. We also want to consider leadership vulnerability, those areas of stress, the unknowns, and then just having to make decisions that we don't know if it's going to be the 
right long-term decision or not, but trusting our instincts, trusting the landscape to the extent that we can, and then looking at how we would return back if needed, if we can. I always consider COVID in terms of uh, the panic aspect or the panic element where we're saying, oh, we have to quickly downsize. We have to suspend programming. We have to stop our spending. But what we have to consider is leading has to involve a two-way transition where we downsize, we cut back, we look at where we are today. We have to also plan to return today and how we do that would make the difference. Looking at the shift, so you're talking about your plan, you're reviewing the plan as a team, you're working collectively, you're identifying your partners, you are standing by your core business, but identifying ways to support that core business. Now you're looking at actually making the shift in light of the pandemic. The first thing you want to consider is your assessment. Assessing what programs are viable, are needed, and have to continue versus those that we can essentially put on hold. You also want to look at putting forth con contingency planning, looking at the, the unknowns and what ifs. If we decide that our core business is going to be um, providing food for daily meals, or if we're gonna decide that our core business is gonna continue around emergency shelters, to what extent can we continue and what if we are unable to serve 100, but we can only serve 50? Start looking at ways to bring in resources through other means other than your grants or donations and the typical cash flow that you have. I also thought about um, two models and techniques that can help in your informed decision making. First is PAC, priority, accountability, and commitment. When you're talking about your decision to shift and pivot, the leader is the pivot person. Transition involves everybody on the team. So you want to be sure that you know what you're prioritizing, you understand the accountability for your decisions, and then the commitment of everyone involved that is both your internal and your external stakeholders. I also think this was a good time to look at some elements of results-based accountability, particularly when you find yourself on the fence or on the porch, and I gotta take a dive, but how am I accountable for these results? These two models, one is that we, one model is what we designed internally within uh, Morgan Graves PAC and RBA is a national renowned model for nonprofit organizations, both of which I believe would make an essential impact on your decisions, your strategic planning, and your understanding of the landscape overall. We also want to take adaptive action, looking at what is important to the work today and how do we adapt to the change that we are experiencing. The key here is resource and partnership development. You cannot expect to continue the work as a small nonprofit, not receiving the level of resources that you're accustomed to 
without building those partnerships. Essentially, those partnerships should be in place now. But on the off chance that they are not, here is the opportunity for you to look at where your external stakeholders are, opportunities to partner, and looking at partnerships of missions that are aligned with your mission, and looking at the possibilities beyond what your organization is doing to co-join those efforts to ensure that there are opportunities to sustain the business through the pandemic and then to return to the extent possible to some aspect of normalcy. And then finally, you want to reconsider the bottom line. What does that mean? Essentially, you first look at what's hurting us as a nonprofit the most, not just because of the pandemic, but the ongoing challenges that we face when we lack what we need to do our best work. You also want to look at the commitment of your stakeholders, both internally and externally. If we know that we are driven by the unknowns and the pandemic certainly is an unknown. This is the time for us to look at best practices, look at models that will support our work and identify ways to continue. I wanna close by um, saying that defending your core business is not always an easy thing to do because you are faced with challenges, you're faced with the decision that will impact people that support you as a leader and support your organization. But if you know that the work is going to have the greater good for those that you're serving in your communities, then by all costs, Look at the opportunity to pivot, to shift your thinking around what it takes to make the organization continue in the face of the pandemic and in the face of any other challenges that you face and continue on with the best work. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Brandon Sterling. I want to um, thank Marnay for uh, speaking to us today. Um, so I just want to clarify the way that the, um, the message system is working, Chad. If you'd like to pose a question to Marnay, you can do that. We're trying to have some, some level of control over um, how much is happening in the chat box. But you can send chats. We, everybody that's on the call can see those chats. She can respond to them. And um, we have somebody taking screenshots of some of the Q&A, so we don't get your question covered, but we think it's important that somebody uh, talk about that later in a follow-up session. So I'm gonna give a minute to see if there's any chat questions. If not, I am going to go ahead and continue. So my name is Brandon Sterling. Um, I'm the former executive director of the Skinker de Bolivar Community Council, which is one of St. Louis's oldest community development corporations. Uh, some of you may know me uh, from previous fund development positions. Uh, some of you that are on the call, our former bosses. So um, I've worked at Better Family Life uh, as development director, Guardian Angel Settlement Association as development director, chief development officer at uh, Employment Connection. Uh, in addition to that, um, I was a consultant for about 12 and a half years and started doing a little bit more of that recently. Um, I've been a local, state, and federal grant reviewer. On the other side of fundraising, 
I've done just about every type of event that you can imagine. Golf tournaments, galas, music festivals, summer concert series, um, tastes, uh, trivia nights, you name it, I've been there. Um, today is really about, you know, what people keep describing as the new normal. Um, those of us that are really engaged in fund development probably wake up and go to sleep thinking about um, the organizations that we work with and the uh, constituents or clients that they serve and what it takes to keep those organizations running. Um, certainly today, COVID-19 really uh, rewrites, at least for the time being, what tools are available to us um, and how we should use the existing tools that we have. Um, I do want to say this before I go much further um, in that um, in some respect we've been here already. So for those of you that know me, you know that I'm a, I try to be a, a glass half full kind of guy. Um, and in that respect, I'm confident that we can get through this moment if we do that intentionally, right? So what do I say, when, what do I mean when I say we've been here? Um, so, you know, we haven't had a, a, a viral outbreak, but we have had the Great Recession, 2007 through 2009. Uh, we know what an economic downturn does both to clients and to organizations. Um, um, unfortunately, uh, uh, George, Floyd's death is quite similar to Michael Brown's death, right? Uh, so we know what uh, our community uh, looks like and feels like when it's hurting and when it's working toward issues like social justice. Uh, as fund developers or as um, EDs a lot of times who are also involved in fundraising, um, it's important to understand the environment around you and uh, to keep it moving, you know, uh, the work must continue. So I'm gonna go over a range of things. This is seriously the lightning round. Uh, they'll fall under three primary categories. Um, and I will say this too. So at the end of the webinar, um, I'm such a novice at this. At the end of the webinar, I'll make sure to email a copy of the presenter notes. So everybody has notes that they use for their, their, their talks today and you'll get a copy of that. So you don't have to feel like um, you have to take notes per se. Uh, in addition, we're recording the webinar and that'll be posted to Black Funders of St. Louis website. By the way, I forgot to mention, I am a member of Black Funders of St. Louis. Okay, so the first topic is communicating your value and your relevance, okay? Um, and this may be a particular um, uh, interest to some of you that I've been calling over the last month, or really the last two months, um, when uh, COVID-19 really felt real, I really reached out to, uh, to several colleagues to just kind of put in their ear um, what I really felt like was uh, uh, a challenge, but also an opportunity, right? Um, and it's worth noting that this and everything that I'm talking about are things that we should be doing all the time, regardless of what's happening in the world. But that um, it's moments like this that coax us to go back to find the time to do the work, right? To not just be involved in the day-to-day -day aspects of the job. Um, all of us should be asking ourselves what sets us apart from other service providers. Absolutely. Um, all of us uh, should have some sense of um, who our clients are and what they need and what other people don't understand about what they need and what their challenges are. Uh, uh, for those of you that have been involved in whatever work you're in, whether that's housing or financial literacy or youth advocacy, violence prevention, you know there's a list of, of assumptions associated with that work and you, you understand that um, some of those things are wrong, right? Uh, so we use moments like this to educate donors and funders, right? 
uh, for both practical reasons, right, uh, to let them know that we understand what's happening, but also to inform them, uh, to give them perspectives that they may not hear in mass media, uh, that they might not pick up. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of people rely on social media, right, and the internet for information, and that's not always the most accurate place. Um, it's absolutely essential that we tell our uh, donors and our funders um, how COVID-19 is impacting uh, our clients primarily and then our organizations. Um, so here's, here's the thing, is that there is no, there's no honor in suffering in silence, right? And, um, People need to understand where you're at. Uh, and, and I promised myself something that I would give these little, uh, a couple of examples or stories. And those of you who know me know I like stories, right? So I have this adage, which is that work that is done but not shared uh, just didn't happen, okay? So some of you are engaged in work. I know that one of my colleagues is on the call right now. They do subsidized housing. I know that some of her tenants have been for, uh, furloughed and uh, they're protecting those tenants by making sure they can stay in their apartments. That's a story that needs to be told. So here's my example. Years ago, I was sitting on the board of a nonprofit. Uh, I went to check in on it after work. And when I walked in, um, what would have normally been bustling with children everywhere was fairly empty. Um, I made my way to, the, to a back meeting room where I saw all the kids there, um, a couple of the staff and a gentleman that I didn't recognize. I sat down and about five minutes into the conversation, I realized that um, I was in the room with the gentleman who was the cellmate of Nelson Mandela, okay? Uh, he was talking to these kids about social justice, about um, finding your personal voice, it was unbelievable. There was no camera. There was no uh, recorder. There was no, there was nothing going on. About two years later, on the front page of the St. Louis Post Dispatch, there was an article about this gentleman and the headline read, and I'm paraphrasing, comes to St. Louis for the first time, right? Uh, it was, it was kind of devastating to see this organization miss an opportunity to describe uh, something that it had already done, okay? Uh, so I can't emphasize enough that it's important that if uh, you found some fantastic ways of working around uh, stay-at-home orders, you think your donors don't want to get bogged down in, in some of that, but they do, right? So again, for those of you that know me, you know I always say that people want to see evidence of critical thinking. Um, you have to tell people how you're able to serve people. If you found a way to tutor kids virtually and it works, somebody needs to know that. Especially if what you're doing is making sure that they're gonna be ready to go back to school after missing two or three months of in-class instruction, right? Um, you have to document what you're doing. We have to make the time to document things. Um, we have to find a way to document those things. We have to start to form our own theories and start to validate the strategies that we're working on. Um, and most importantly, we need to give regular updates to our donors and our funders, okay? Um, so um, if, it, if at this point you're still wondering what all of this has to do with retaining or growing your database or your, your donor base, this is really about uh, understanding that the beginning of a relationship with a donor starts at information and communication, okay? Um, so the tips for this particular section, this conversation about communicating your value and your, uh, your relevance is that you need to be communicating with your donors and your clients and your funders on a regular basis. Um, there are still a lot of nonprofits that are not sending out regular email notices or don't understand that, that email newsletters can be interesting. They can have client stories. Uh, this would be a fantastic time to showcase how one of your social workers is working remotely and how many clients they've been able to see, um, depending on your audience, right? Uh, building something that's interesting for people. Um, you've already started to see some of the uh, 
bigger organizations use videos as a way of communicating with, um, with constituents, whether those be donors or clients. Uh, there's never been a better appetite for video content right now, whether that's to Facebook or Instagram or to YouTube. Um, and you can build in situations with that where you get to add donate links at the bottom, right? What we're, what we're aiming at is keeping people informed and always driving home the point that regardless of what's happening in the world, the nonprofit that I'm at is relevant. It provides relevant solutions. And for those of you that have dealt with really savvy donors and really savvy funders, you understand that they're always looking at you to determine whether or not you're flexible and adaptable. So keep all of that in mind. Um, I don't see a lot of, I need to see more nonprofits utilize social media, in particular paid advertisements on social media. Um, for those of you that have never done it, it is incredibly inexpensive and it is incredibly effective, right? So here's my COVID-19 example. Covenant House ran um, COVID-19 related uh, uh, Facebook ads for close to two months, close to two months. I saw them almost every day. It clearly identified who their clients were and the problems that they faced, clearly identified how they were adjusting, uh, adjusting to the new normal and um, it sold me. I've known that Covenant House existed for as forever. But when I watched that, I made a decision that I need to make a donation this year. So we're looking for those moments where um, we can change somebody's perception of us or even sharpen it a little bit if they, still, if they already have a positive uh, impression of us. Um, so, we know at some point uh, people will slowly start to go back to work and be in office environments. Uh, this is always one that, that people tend to think I'm a little nuts, but I have used it, I've tested it. It's very, very effective. There's this uh, system called blip billboards, which are those LCD billboards that you see on the high, highway. Um, they are fantastic. And they are, they, are near, they are just about as inexpensive as placing an ad on Twitter or Facebook and Instagram. They're less, they're less, they're more affordable than traditional billboards. Uh, um, they're excellent opportunities to put a message right in front of people as they drive back and forth, right? Um, I'm not gonna put anybody in the spot, but I know that there's some nonprofits that are in the room that have in fact used billboards and had positive, in, uh, had positive outcomes as a result of that. And I know it's one of those things that people think is a little overboard, but you really have to start thinking outside of your comfort zone if you want to get in front of people. So this next section is a nice segue about getting out of your comfort zone and really kind of pushing the envelope a little bit. Um, it's about anticipating emerging and expanding needs. Um, so again, if you've been one of the people I've been talking to over the last month or two months, uh, one of the things that I've really tried to drive home is that really everything about our work that we consider um, a given, right? The, the norm is something that someone else advocated for. It's something that someone else figured out, someone else stepped out in front and said, there's a problem or there's a better way to solve a problem. And certainly for um, black institutions, um, uh, which are historically underinvested in, right? Um, and sometimes overlooked, uh, it's important for us to get out front, to position ourselves as thought leaders and subject matter experts, um, to challenge assumptions, as I talked about earlier, that people may have about particular populations or interventions, and um, start to test that stuff, right? Uh, ask yourself the questions, what future challenges await the populations that you serve? What strategies do you suggest? How do they align with the values of your donors and your funders? Um, how can you make them buy into um, your philosophy or your strategy uh, for helping people? Um, so I mentioned this before tracking and I do this a lot. Uh, it's very important that we search for and document trends uh, with our existing and new clients. 
if over the last month you've seen middle class people that wouldn't typically need to come to your food pantry or wouldn't typically need utility assistance meet that, that's a trend. That's something you should be tracking. Okay. Um, and, you know, it's important to look for research that both confirms and challenges your theory, right? Whatever that may be. Uh, what's most important is that you identify strategies uh, or ways of improving a best practice or an emerging practice. You research those things and you get courageous and you get out front and you start talking to people. Um, I am going to put somebody on the spot today. I think one of the, the organizations that's done a really good job of doing this is uh, Better Family Life. Uh, it's literally impossible in St. Louis to talk about violence prevention, gang abatement, any topic around that without their name coming up. A part of that is that they've always positioned themselves as a voice. They've always um, generated the conversation rather than waiting for other people to generate the conversation, right? How do we duplicate that in our particular work? What do you know about housing? What do you know about food insecurity? Uh, what do you know about inclusion, right, that other people don't understand? Um, one of the things that I've been doing a lot lately that I believe works, that I believe that more nonprofits should do, is creating content, in particular white papers, if you can. Uh, research papers are incredible, valuable, and incredibly valuable ways to position yourself as a subject matter expert, um, to catch the eye of donors, um, and the general public. So here's my example. Uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote a, a, a white paper on um, a type of program called home sharing. Um, then offered some examples of the pilot program that I was, I was managing and um, how it met or exceeded some of uh, the challenges with home share programs. A couple of years later, uh, uh, entity in California called me and said that they were generating their own white paper that was going to be shared among funders uh, who served older adults, which was my home share program did, um, and they wanted to put us forth as an emerging practice, right? So sometimes we do work in, in fund development, groundwork, foundational work um, that pays off on the back end, right? Uh, understanding what the future challenges are, uh, writing about that, sharing about that, all those things position you for the future. And they broaden your funding opportunities, right? So I'm probably getting close to my time. Am I timekeeper? Nod your head if I'm getting close to my time. <laughs> um, so I'm going to run through a couple of examples here and then I'm going to move to this last topic really quickly. Um, so one of the things that was shared with me uh, a while back that really uh, impressed upon me that I rethink about a program and how to fund that in a nonlinear way was um, a set of uh, something called the social determinants of health. So depending on what country you're in, there's 10 or 12 of them. Um, I'm mentioning that in particular for you guys because there's a very, very high chance if you're on this call that if you go through the 12 social determinants of health, you will realize that you are doing a program that has already been identified as having some impact on public health, okay? Uh, so if you're looking for moments of, I see that some money's coming out around COVID-19, some of it's around health or public health, but we're not a healthcare provider. Looking at the social determinants of health may help you find a way to legitimately get at some of that money or partner with somebody to get to some of that money to do the work, right? Um, and again, it's a really good exercise in teaching yourself to be nonlinear and how you look at your programs and not just to say we do holistic programming, but look at how it impacts lots of different aspects of the person's life and how you can use that to your benefit, right? Um, another small uh, research tool that I use, really it's a big research tool, something called Demographics Now. You can use it for free if you have a library card with St. Louis County or St. Louis City. Uh, if you went out and tried to buy it, I'm pretty sure it costs you to somewhere between seven and ten thousand dollars. But you can use it for free online through the library. Um, they have data sets on over 200 million Americans all over the United States. It's a wonderful tool to demonstrate need, especially around poverty, housing, age, 
Um, it also tracks, um, it, it does projections for population loss, population increase, migrations, et cetera. So I'm gonna keep it moving. The last and final section is to be creative and proactive about uh, fundraising. Uh, I do want to offer this caveat, which was a part of my closing statement, but I may run out of time, so I want to get to this, is that, so you need to look at your own level of visibility, which is a part of the reason why I started in the beginning about uh, making sure people know your relevance and your value, your size, your capacity, your market, your program focus, all of those things and determine what diversified funding looks like for you right? Um, it will not be the same as another organization. There are some organizations that unfortunately are not ready for large federal grants, maybe not ready for any federal grants, right? There are some that have fantastic relationships here locally, and they're going to get to local money that you're never going to get to, okay? Um, you need to take a look at yourself. And on top of that, Go through some of these items and think about ways to increase your visibility, to increase uh, public awareness of you as a subject matter expert so you can change some of those perceptions that institutions might have of you, right? So if nothing else, it's, it's either the time or the amount of money you've managed before that uh, may be a stumbling block. So with that, I've got five minutes. <laughs> uh, very quickly, on the sheet that you're gonna get, you're gonna get a link to uh, Missouri Foundation for Health's MOCAPS, uh, COVID-19 email alerts, uh, MH, MFH's MOCAP program also allows you to apply to have a consultant write health-related grants for you that MA, uh, MFH pays for. It doesn't come out of your pocket. Um, I also sent you a link, you'll get a link uh, to uh, a spot on TechSoup where they've isolated all the COVID-19 related uh, funding opportunities across the country. Uh, there's a resource page on Black Funders of St. Louis's page as well. Um, and with that, I'm going to shut it down. Um, I'll take Q&A if there is any. I do have a couple of points about virtual fundraising that if I can't deal with it now, I'll deal with it on the back end before we do closing. So I think I do have one question. So the question is, is how do we continue to, co to um, communicate with community members who aren't online? Um, so if we're talking about fundraising, I didn't bring up annual appeals. And the person who sent this question knows that I'm big on annual appeals. Um, I believe annual appeals will still work. Matter of fact, I, I pull one out. So the NAACP Legal Defense Fund is one of my favorite national charities, and they sent me this little thing. Of course, it's backwards, so you won't be able to read it, but I'll read it to you at the top. It says, at this moment, protecting our civil and human rights is more important than ever, right? They've sent me two mailings since, since February or, or early March. Um, I think annual appeals are a way to, to get to people. Um, I think it really depends on your budget, whether you just do a regular um, uh, full mailing that isn't an ask. I didn't mention it earlier, but it's important in terms of building relationships with donors. You just need to check in with them before you make your ask or as a part of your ask. Uh, you need to realize the other person on the other side is a human being. For bigger donors, that is a personal connection. That is a email or a phone call directly to them. To your average donor, that is a regular email or letter to them. Um, uh, but I, I do want to say this, and then I'll get, I'll get off and, and let Kim get on, is that um, I was cautioned a few years ago, I was in Boston, um, and some folks were there from, from the AARP, and they cautioned me to assume, and then maybe I'm making an assumption too, Janet, uh, they caution me to assume that because uh, someone may be older, that they're not as connected, right? Uh, or using the internet technologically savvy and that sort. Um, uh, the question becomes is whether uh, technology is a barrier because of income or, or age or, or interest. In which case, if they're an older population, 
snail mail works anyways, right? That's something they were they were raised up seeing and, and receiving, and it works. Okay, I think that's the last question. I'm gonna pass it on to our next speaker, which is Kimberly. Hey, just hold on. Hey, Kim. Okay. Can you hear me? We're going to do a mic check. You can? Okay. Can everyone hear Kim? Panelists, shake your head yes if you can hear Kim. I see shake. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll go back and start over a little bit. First of all, I was actually thanking you, Miranda, um, and uh, the Black Fund of St. Louis for putting this this uh, panel discussion together and this conversation uh, you know i it's needed for so many different reasons um hopefully we continue to do it beyond just this crisis um and beyond this moment that we can um, continue to foster reinvestment back into our own communities um, to foster um, knowledge sharing within ourselves um, because I'm, I'm a firm believer that we have everything that we need. And so um, I think this is um, perfect opportunity to share what each and every one of us has to give and, and even the individuals that are uh, logging in and, and participants today, there's information that you have um, that, you know, we don't have. So this is um, just, a, I think, a great opportunity to um, share with one another and hopefully will be the first of many opportunities that we do this. Um, quick background because everyone else did an introduction of themselves. Um, my name is Kim Simley. I am a, a CPA, uh, but former Executive Vice President um, and CFO of RX Outreach. Um, I've been in accounting for, believe it or not, almost, I, I say believe it or not because I can't believe it, um, close to 20 years. Um, and my background has been in several different industries. And the reason I want to say that is because I think it's important, um, especially as we kind of talk through some of these topics today. Um, so I uh, started out in public accounting. I've, I've done large telecommunications organizations. I've done private, I've done nonprofit healthcare for the last 10 years. And so with that being said, when we, when we talk through surviving through a financial downturn, um, it's kind of pretty much similar for all of us right now. <laughs> so we're kind of all in the, in, the, in the same boat, whether you're a, a nonprofit that is, you know, got a $20,000 budget or you are Monsanto, right, with um, 100 plus, 200, whatever million dollars going on. Um, and and it's it's really we're we're kind of in the same types of uh, type of boat. So the conversation that we're going to have um, and the information that I'm giving you um, is the same type of information that I would give whether we were talking to again the head of AT and T or talking to um, a Deaconess Foundation or talking to um, Family Support Center, wh whatever it is. It would, it would really be kind of the same conversation. And so um, one of the things I want to start off saying, because we're specifically talking to individuals today that are nonprofit organizations, when we shift and start speaking nonprofits, and I've been in nonprofits for about 10 years now, um, sometimes the, the, the um, view gets a little fuzzy when we try to mix our mission with our money. <laughs> And so we, we get a little uncomfortable, you know, when we talk about mission and then we got to have money conversations and then we got to have 
right now because we are in um, what we're calling a financial downturn. We're in a, a crisis, right? So we may have to have hard conversations. Um, with that in mind, I want to assure everyone that how I approach every uh, financial decision, um, tough, not tough, is, is through the lens of um, managing people. Because your, your nonprofit and your mission that you, that you hold dear to your heart and that you've invested into and been passionate about for the X, X number of years, at the core of what it is, it's, it's, it's about people, right? So it's people, whether they're within, um, within your four walls, so whether it's your employees and your staff, or whether it's the people that you serve, whether it's your constituents and your community, it's always about people. And so I say that to say, as we even kind of talk through some financial matters and um, even some legal matters, I still want us to keep in mind that we're doing that through the lens of a people-centric focus. We're, we're still doing that not in disregard of your mission, not um, overlooking the fact that, you know, we have a goal that's not just to bring in as much money as we can, but it's to serve this set of individuals. And so um, even though we're, we're going to kind of dive down a little bit, um, I know we've got you know, not a, a tremendous amount of time, but we're going to dive down a little bit. But even as we dive down, just keep that in mind that I haven't forgotten that. And I, I would encourage you as well, as you go back into your, your offices, or right now, the home is the office for many of us, um, and have these conversations that still want to keep a responsibility to the people that you serve and the people that you work with each and every day. Okay. So, all of that precursor kind of out the way. Um, one of the, so what I've been charged to talk about is surviving the economic downturn, right? And when they, uh, Brandon called me, he was like, I want you to talk about surviving the economic downturn. I'm like, good grief, you know, <laughs> how do I, how do I do that? You know, what do we talk about? Thanks, Brandon, for that lofty um, question and charge. So, I don't know if I'm going to have the full answer, but I think what we'll talk through right now are some really good guidelines on how to get you, how to get you there. And the, the main thing right now is that before we kind of dive into it, is you're going to have to plan to survive. You're going to have to plan and be intentional with surviving an economic downturn. So it's, it's, all of this is about, about planning, um, planning to arrive to X. Point. Where, where do we want to be by the end of December? Where would we like to be by 2021? Um, where do we want to be by the end of this month? You know, just, let's just be honest. We may not be able to think past the end of this year. Many of us are thinking past how are we going to get through this month. And how we get through this month starts with we got to stop and think about it, right? We have to be intentional and think about it. And, and sometimes when it's the crisis situation um, or the unfavorable situation, those are the scary moments and those are the exact things we don't want to think about. <laughs> so it, it's kind of a, you know, um, double-edged sword, but we're going to get through it and we're going to get through it together. So right out the gate, um, planning and many of the tools that I'm, tools that I'm going to talk about right now, technically they should not be new to you. Okay, so they should not be new tools. They should be a process in which now we're going through and either updating, revising, changing some assumptions to the tools that we've previously been exist, uh, using to manage the business because now we have additional risk factors. Now we have new unknowns. Now we have all of these things that we now want to incorporate into our existing planning and managing of the business. That's the best case scenario. Now, everyone may not have these tools, right? So I understand that. If that is you and you may not have had these things in place, don't panic. That just means now we got to stop and put them in place, okay? So right off the bat, uh, part of planning in, in this particular time is I would encourage everyone, bullet point one, establish a plan for rapid decision making and for planning, okay? That, start the plan by start gathering a team of people, of trusted individuals that you, um, that, you, that you trust to help you make tough times right now, tough decisions. You don't want to be the one, especially if you're the ED on the, on the, um, on the call or something like that, you don't want to be the one that's 
everything falls in your plate. Every financial decision, every cash decision, every if you have to furlough, all those decisions fall in your lap. That's that's actually too much. So gather your team of people, and I think Monet, you uh, referenced it as well, um, to to help you make these decisions. Um, I would include what your team should look like, um, HR for sure, your finance person, your program directors, um, any operational people, IT people, legal. Now, you may not have all of those people on staff, and I get that, right? But at the very minimum, your team should be your HR person, your finance people, and your program directors. You, your, your, your people that you trust to help you make tough decisions right now, and then be able to have access and reach someone um, that's in IT. Be able to reach someone with legal because you're still going to need um, these types of insights in managing your, and, and coming to decisions and conclusions. If they're not on staff, fine, but search around, um, uh, reach outside of the organization, and try to get um, advice from organization or from these types of entities to help you through this process. The next thing I would say is understanding, uh, I'm titling this understand your coverage, okay? And again, this is one of those things that technically should be in place. Um, right now, they're, pull out those insurance policies that you have, right? We, we get insurance um, with the hope that we never have to use it. And hopefully you don't have to use it. I can tell you, you know, with my background of 20 plus years of running organizations and, and leading financial matters, I've had to use it. Um, so it happens and it happens to us all. It just is life. Um, we, we, we all, I think many of us live in St. Louis. And so I've been in situations where tornadoes came and knocked off the entire roof. Um, we had to stop operations for weeks and things like that. That's where insurance comes in. And so what I want you to do is, is dust those insurance policies off, blow them off, um, and then and take a little bit of time to read them. You know, I, I know that's not the, the fun thing to do, but you got to take an afternoon, a day, or, or however you can get through it, and read some of those policies. Specifically, look for um, within your policies if you have business interruption insurance. Because right now, many of us, um, our business may just be completely shut down. It may be shut down for a couple of weeks. We probably just came out of that, right? Uh, what was that? March, April, our entire city at some point was kind of shut down. We didn't know if we were going to open back up, all of these different things. There may be insurance within your policy to help you cover that period that you did not have operations, um, that you could not serve constituents, whatever it is, to help you through that process. The next thing with, with looking at your insurance policies, um, we are in a, a pandemic, right? And so if you have individuals and employees coming to work, um, we don't know if they will be uh, have exposure to COVID-19 while they're working or if they have, you know, we always say have an accident while you're working and things like that. We, I, I've not heard this happen yet, but this is the planning ahead, right? So I would still go through and make sure, hey, do I have workers comp? What does it say? What, what's the process of me even going through? If something happens, what do I need to do? Who do I call at the minimum um, to, to execute this policy because I have this benefit? I, need, I may need to actually use it right now. And then obviously always look for general liability insurance. What, what, what's my coverage um, just within, within the organization? If you have an umbrella coverage as well, um, umbrella coverage, most, most or nonprofits, if they don't have all of those details, they usually will get an umbrella coverage, uh, umbrella policy, which is kind of a catch-all. If, if any of these types of things happen, um, I'm covered for something up to a certain amount. And so I would pull that back out and, again, read through it. Um, help, you, help yourself understand what, um, what, I do, what benefits exist for me that I may not know is floating out there. Um, and then I would also look at your board of directors coverage right now, because uh, if you got a strong board, your board should be helping you also make decisions right now. Um, this is part of your team. You know, this is part of you getting through this process. And you want to make sure, too, that your board isn't going to be liable for some decision a year from now. That we, we just have to make this call 
um, because we we have to make this call right now. And that that's not going to come back a year from now or something like that to personally impact your, your board. So I would stop and look at all of those types of things. And then we'll get to the next point, which is actually establishing a contingency cash flow forecast. Okay. So those things kind of set the foundation and help you identify even further where some risk areas could be for you. Um, and maybe if there's some gaps and some holes, what gaps and holes need to be filled and plugged and how quickly can you plug them? Um, you might not be able to do it right, right now, but even knowing that it exists helps you to know where to step over a hole, right? <laughs> where, to, where to be careful. Um, so you, you at least have to know what is going on. Okay, so a contingency plan, and, and my fellow pan panelists have used that word a couple of times um, as well. Um, a, a contingency plan is actually a big lofty thing, and we're not going to talk about the big lofty part of a contingency plan today, but we're going to talk about a contingency cash flow forecast, because that's really where we get into asking kind of these hard questions or answering the hard questions. Do I have, um, do I have enough money to get through May? Do I have enough? Um, what happens if we don't do the annual gala this year? What happens if, you know, we don't get the, the contributions? What if our contributions drop to 70%? What happens? Can we survive? So those are the kinds of questions that are probably looming in our hearts right now. And what I'm going to walk through is a forecast on how to help you answer those questions. Um, I'm going to actually switch my screen, and I'm going to pull up a slide, actually an Excel sheet, do not be afraid of it. It's going to look scary. So we're going to get through it together. Do not be afraid, I promise you, of what I'm about to show you. So I just showed you something, and there's a lot of numbers, right? Do, don't, don't worry about it. Um, we're going to get through it. So right now what you're looking at is a cash flow projection. This is um, a cash flow projection that in, in full transparency, you should have been using something like this to manage your business before the crisis hit, okay? So if you have something like this in place, great. Pull this out. I'm going to show you how to kind of update it um, for a couple of scenarios and help you to uh, determine um, trigger points for your organization. If you don't have this, here it is, um, and I'm going to kind of walk through what this should look like for you. Um, so really quickly, I just always like to go through the layout of these sorts of things so we can all understand it together. So on this left side here, you've got um, cash received. Um, where are all the different sources of cash that can come in for your nonprofit? Um, always start off with your beginning cash. What do I have right now in the bank? Where I'm, what's my starting point? And then you've got you know, grant contributions could be one thing that could be coming in, board contributions, annual gala, and then other sources of revenue, whatever they may be. You can actually make this as detailed as you like right here. Um, you, can, you can break this down to specific names. You know, if you have key donors that are, are significant to your and critical to your operations, put their name here, you know, um, just list them out. How much do you expect them to give you or have they traditionally given you in August? How much have they traditionally given you in July? You know, literally list this thing out so you can have a full view of what's really going on. Um, and then I'm going to screen, uh, scroll down a little bit. So you've got cash dispersed. Where's the money going out, right? So every dollar, I always say every single dollar goes somewhere. It's coming in. Where does it go? Um, so the cash dispersed. I separated this between program costs, so those dollars that directly go into your services, and then your administrative costs. Um, this is an example, so yours won't be exactly this, but I would encourage you to update this. Salaries, always going to be there. Benefits, fringe benefits, program supplies. You may have IT um, be significant. You may have postage. Whatever your significant accounts are, put them in here. Your administrative costs. Um, I would lay these out as well. Um, this is where your legal comes in, your travel, your advertising, your fundraising. Drop these things in here, your, your lease cost. And so right off the bat, um, I'm calling June, this month of June, 
I call it the original, but say this is our starting point. This was our pre-crisis month. This was our healthy month in June, okay, in this example. And so in this example, um, they're used to bringing in about $54,000 in cash a month, okay? And they're used to uh, dispersing about $42,000 in cash each month, okay? So there, it leaves them a little bit of dollars left over each month. Um, this isn't completely unheard of, but this is, this is their example. This is a normal month. So what happens is what I want you to do is take this and build your scenarios. I want you to build out at least three scenarios. One scenario that your revenue drops by 50%. Boom, it's gone. Um, you can drop it and, and you can lay it out by month, how I've done it here, but 50% of this is gone. So in uh, June, you brought in 30,000. By July, I'm only bringing in 15,000. And what does that look like for me in the bottom line? In this particular month, I didn't change any of my expenses. I didn't, so I'm paying out the exact same amount of cost, which means now, I have a deficit of $14,950, okay, boom. So immediately I know what I have to solve for. That's my X. And you want to build that out for each scenario. Again, 50%, I've got a tab for each one. Um, I would do one of these templates for a partial shutdown. What I lose, um, um, three of my programs. Um, roll that in here. What does that look like for, from your revenue? Roll in, what if I lose um, three of my key donors? Roll that in here into your analysis that I've lost. Now, um, I was normally getting from three donors $75,000. I've lost those three key donors. $75,000 is gone. And so then that then helps you to understand how much in terms of dollars and a quantity do I have um, that I need to solve for, that I need to close that gap. And then at that point, you go in and you look for it, to be honest. It's not that, you know, you got to look for it. Where do, where do I, um, where do I, where can I um, reduce costs? Um, uh, some of this will be organic because if you've lost the program, unfortunately, you may have lost the employee that goes with that program. So some of that with the salaries and wages may be organic and will naturally decrease. And some of it will be a decision that has to be made. Unfortunately, um, in most organizations, specifically in nonprofits, because if they're high service organizations, most of your costs are going to be sitting in salaries and benefits. Okay, so you can see just right off the bat here, that's eighteen thousand dollars in this month um, in program costs. That those dollars are sitting there. And so I'm going to switch back and talk through this a little. Well, let me show you this real quick. Um, just so you can see the full layout, I've done this for the entire year or the remaining of this year, uh, June through December, and I did a year to date, but then we have actuals, right? So we know what happened January through May. You want to kind of just drop that in, what actually happened January through May, and now you've got a full year-end projection. What, what is 1231-2020 going to look like for my nonprofit? This helps you to understand that. And then this tool helps you to kind of tweak what do you want it to look like. Um, I always compare that to the budget. What did I think I was, what did, what did I want to happen and how far we're off, that kind of thing. I always like to look at things in terms of dollar change and percent change because they can help tell the story. And so I'm going to switch back and stop scaring you so much. Okay, so we're back. Um, the reason I wanted to go into that level of a, of a deep dive is because I want you to see what it kind of should look like, um, what the process should look like for you as you go through answering these hard questions. You, you, you can't get to the hard questions without the, you can't get to the answers without the data. And so that template helps you to understand where are we, what's the hole, what's the shortfall, and then um, where can I pull those dollars? Um, most people, unfortunately, it's going to be in salaries and wages. But then even with salaries and wages, um, one of the things I, I did want to talk about, too, is communicating that um, 
when you have to make these tough decisions to reduce head count, my first suggestion would be to go to furloughing that employee as opposed to completely terminating them. Because especially if they're an employee that you want to work with, I mean, they're, they're a good fit, they're invested in your mission, and you want them to stay, you, you don't want to terminate that employee. Um, you want to be able to, in, in, a, in some period of time, go back and bring them back on. Um, and it's just going to be easier for you and for, you, for them if you're able to furlough, furlough them versus um, actually a termination. And so part of that, too, is this is, again, that people conversation that we talk through. Even though the dollars may tell you, hey, I've got to reduce, I've got to reduce headcount um, by $15,000 monthly, um, that's going to back into the number of employees and, and, and all of these different things that need to happen. Then beyond that, I think that's when you have the conversation of um, who do I really want to stick around? Who do I still need in-house to help us through this process that I can't afford to furlough? I need you actually here every day helping us make the decisions. Um, I need you still running this program. You know, so you, you can't cut yourself so deep where you're now dying. Um, you, but there, there may be a cut um, that may have to, they may have to be patched up, um, but you don't want to cut yourself to the point of, of death. And then I'm going to check my time real quick. Where am I at? Okay. So um, with that being said, another thing, too, when you're looking at the cost of things and trying to help yourself understand do I need this cost? Do I not need this cost? Again, for most of you, um, the the major, the bulk of the costs are going to be in salary. But then after that, you you got to look at whether it's a fixed cost or a variable cost. Whether this is a cost that I always look at fixed versus variable in terms of is this a cost that is the pillar of my organization that I have to have that I can't change that I'm contracted to that I'm legally bound in that this this is this is going to happen like rent, right? So there's legal. Um, you have a contract for your lease or for your mortgage that is going to happen, and we're going to talk a little bit about that too because we might be able to get around that too. Um, but technically, it's it's there. So if that's the case, then you might. That's a hard call. You may not be able to have that much wiggle room, wiggle room with that. But your variable costs are costs that. Um, change with circumstances, change with volumes, change with programs, change with production, those sorts of things. Those are going to be kind of your low-hanging fruit to be able to go and see, hey, can I quickly remove some of these costs or some of these organically falling off um, and analyze that and then update your contingency plan to reflect that, okay? So just I said that because that's important to note. And then the last thing, um, before I go to the last thing, once you do all of those, that, that, that exercise, once you do that exercise, and I would encourage you to don't do that exercise ED by yourself. Do that exercise again with your team. <laughs> you may start it off, you may put the, the template together, but when you go into the room to talk about it and have to make decisions, bring that template with you and bring your team with you so you guys can powwow around that together and say, hey, this is, this is the raw fact. This is where we are. This is what the end of July is going to look like if we don't do something. Let's figure it out, okay? So after that, and once you get to the point where you really know kind of where you are and what, what needs to happen, okay, communicate, communicate, communicate. Communicate, communicate. I, I can't keep saying that enough because this is a place where we don't feel comfortable talking about our, our um our shortfalls or our problems or our pain points. This is where we kind of want to hide that. Don't talk, but this is when I'm telling you, you need to talk. It's going to help you. So who are you talking to? You're talking to your vendors and your suppliers. You're talking to them, um, who, who, whoever your key vendor suppliers are. You want to talk to them because you need to see if, ha if they have supply chain issues, did something happen or they're in that maybe if you are a diaper bank and the diapers are short, and now I can't get diapers to continue the program, that's, that's a problem. So you need to know that on the front end. Um, you need to know if there's pricing changes because we are in a pandemic, people are, are changing prices. So is the price for that diaper 
now different that it's going to cost me two and a half times to get the same diaper that I need to run this program. You need to know that. So that's only the best way to do that is communicate. Um, the next thing, contact your landlord, your mortgagee, your bankers, your legislators, because they need to know after you do that contingency plan, if I have a problem um, and I am now in a place that I'm going to need some help, um, I don't. I don't want them to be surprised when September comes and you are having a trouble paying your mortgage. They should know today that I'm in. I have a problem. I may need help paying my mortgage. I may need help paying this lease. I may need help because there's programs right now that are popping up every day to try to assist organizations and nonprofits to help you. If you don't say anything, they can't help, and then you also don't know that the program even exists. So contact your landlords, your bankers, um, legislators. I, I put that on there because I know a couple of examples where contacting their local legislators, we operate our nonprofits in community, right? We operate for the, for the benefit of the community. And so a lot of times, if your legislator knows that you're struggling to survive, um, and they know you've been providing a service for an uh, after-school program for kids or a reading program for kids for the last five, ten years, they want you to still continue to do that. And they may be able to help you to do that and to continue to do that. But if they don't know, um, they, they can't help either. So I know personally um, individual um, that reached out in Ferguson to their local legislator and ended up receiving and walking away with a $5,000 grant just because they opened their mouth. And so don't, don't be silent right now. This is not the time to be shy or embarrassed or silent. Uh, like I said, we're all in this together, so we're going to make it through it together. Um, last thing I want to say about that, uh, with the, the contacting the landlord and the bankers is – I want to talk briefly about these deferment programs because there's a lot of deferment programs that are coming out um, that will defer payments for you for three months, for six months, and those sorts of things. It, it may not be bad and it may work for you, but please read through the details and the fine lines of that because a deferment program may defer only to have it be paid in full at the end of that three months. And so for many of us, that did not help me. <laughs> so if you just deferred me for three months just to then put a full call on it, that did not help me. Um, but it would help me if you deferred me for three months and then allowed me to roll that three months into the duration of my loan or the duration of the contract and the agreement on some kind of systematic basis. Now that helps me. And so you, you really want to be careful when you look at these deferment programs because there's kind of two sets of them out there, and one looks good to me and one does not look good to me. Um, so I think I'm almost close to time. I'm going to wrap it up. There were other things I'll say, but they um, I think these best practices will actually show up in your handout that you have um, and that will be provided to you. Um, the, bef before I open up to questions, one thing that I do want to – um, talk about, say real quickly, is that this entire thing is about perspective, okay? This is about perspective and your per perception of what's happening. If you perceive that you're going to survive and get through it, then it's a likelihood that you'll fight to get through it. And you'll, you'll do these things that Monet and Brandon and myself have been talking about, of planning and putting some intention behind getting through it. If you unfortunately perceive that this is doomsday and we're not going to make it, um, then that's your perception. And so you're kind of going to go through these next few months in that mindset. And so I would encourage you as you're sitting in your rooms and your boardrooms and making these decisions is before you even start this process, ask myself, do I see myself making it through this? If you, if the answer is yes, and, and wait till you get to a yes, I see myself making it through it. Then now start the process of the contingency plan. Then start what Brandon said. Then start what Monet said. Because if, if you don't see yourself getting through it, um, everything we've said has kind of been mute. Um, you gotta you got to see it for yourself, and then um, you'll, you'll start to do the work, and we'll, we'll, be, we'll make it on the other side. So I think, do I have questions? Or 
I don't know. I don't. I know a few people have asked for spreadsheets, and I'll make sure we'll get the spreadsheet out um, and things like that. Um, I think that's great. So I, I don't have any more questions. Um, only thing I can say is please, like uh, Miranda said, rest, take care of yourself. Um, if the decision gets too hard, I, I know hard decisions and they can be a headache and troubling. If they do, take a step back, breathe, walk away from it, maybe for a day overnight and come back to it when you're on a, on a rested place and then can make that decision um, based upon all the tools that we've given you today. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, if we could see all of you, I'm sure everybody will be clapping right now. Um, I am Lisa Potts from Project Director from the St. Louis Mental Health Board. I want to thank all of our panelists, Brandon, Marnay, Miranda, and Kimberly. And I also want to thank MHB as well as Deaconess Foundation for hosting this webinar today. There were 48 of you on the call today. And we are so very excited and it has definitely exceeded our expectations. Um, we thought we all week long, Brandon's been saying, we're at capacity, we're at capacity. And so, I, and, I, and I'm steady texting people saying, you know, join in, join in. So, but it's been really great. We're really excited. Um, we have about five minutes left. We wanna be respectful of your time, but we definitely just wanted to, again, thank everybody for being here today and take this opportunity to kind of figure out what's next. We definitely feel like we're onto something, that this is very needed, not just because of what's happening right now, but especially now. And so you heard three excellent presentations today about strategic planning, fund development, financial planning. Which of those topics really resonated with you? Which of those topics align with the needs of your organization? You will be receiving a post attendee survey like we always do, but that's because we really want to hear from you and we want to know what we should be doing differently and how can we better serve you. I want to say that all of the presenters here today have committed to coming back with you in, in a couple of weeks if you are interested in doing like a deeper dive. I know when Kimberly first put that spreadsheet up, I think Miranda was getting ready to run and I was just like, oh Lord. So, but I will admit, unlike Miranda, I got excited the more Kimberly talked about it because I like the fact that you could manipulate it. And I've already been writing myself notes to my treasurer, like, oh, we need one of those. And when are we having a meeting just to talk about that? So that to me is very important, but there may be some other things that you really just want to spend some one-on-one -on -one time. You really want to be unafraid of that budget and pick Kimberly's brain or may, Marnay may have said something about strategic planning that you really want to know about. And we know Brandon knows everything, so you may just want to pick his brain. And you might just have $300 and be like, Miranda, where do I send the check? Whatever that is, they are committed to coming back in a couple of weeks if you just want to do that deep dive. We also are going to ask you, what topics are you interested in? You may want to know more about board development or program design or budgeting. I actually wanted to know when, I, when you talked about the insurance about boards, I'm like, man, I sit on a lot of boards. Do we have insurance? And what is it for? What, what, do, what could I possibly do as a board member that I need to be protected from? So those are the kind of deeper questions that we might want to delve into with you guys. So you will receive a post survey. Most of the questions today were really just about, can I get that information? So I think you guys did an excellent job of delivering the messages and you will at Brandon has already put a link to the speaker's notes in the chat, but we will also make sure that you get that information mailed out. We will also send you out the scary budget. Don't be afraid when you click on that. And but the main thing is we want to know how far do we want to keep this? What's this time frame uh, long enough? What's the frequency? Do we want to come together once a month or once a quarter? We just want to be here to support you. All of us are connected to a lot of other you know, talented professionals that we can and will commit to bringing to the table to answer the questions that you may have trying to survive um, through this pandemic. Um, to the point made earlier, this is not downtime. You know, I mean, we all had maybe that first, you know, 30 days, you know, we, we had the right to be depressed. It was like when I got sent home in March, I thought I was coming back the next week. I had no idea I would still be sitting here several months later. 
but the time now is to act. The time now is to what's next. If for some reason you do think your organization is not going to vibe, you just need to figure out what is the next chapter going to be. It maybe just means the end to this chapter, but what is the new chapter going to look like? And we have a lot of experts around the table that can actually help get you there. So it is 1129. Do we have any other questions? Uh, somebody said terrific job by all. I definitely echo that. So again, thank everyone in particular, uh, MHB as well as Deaconess Foundation and to all of our panelists and presenters. Uh, thank you again. And we hope that uh, we'll see everybody in a couple of weeks uh, for a deeper dive and or for some additional uh, program topics. So with that, it is exactly 1130 and I do believe in being on time. So thank everybody for being here. <laughs>